You're listening to the Talking Headways Podcast Network. This is Talking Headways, a weekly podcast about sustainable transportation and urban design. I'm Jeff Wood. This week, we're joined by Danielle Aragoni, AARP's Director of Livable Communities. Danielle chats with us about how AARP is working in every state to help cities become more age-friendly, and how we can think more holistically about aging in place. Stay with us. Today's podcast is brought to you by our generous Patreon supporters. Thanks so much for supporting the show. We couldn't do it without you. To join this merry band of infrastructure nerds and zoning wizards, go to patreon.com slash the overhead wire. $2 a month and I'll send some stickers and a handwritten note. $10 a month and you'll get one of our bus-only scarves with dedicated lane designs. And finally, every donation will have access to bonus features including podcast extras that might not fit in the original cut. That's patreon.com slash the overhead wire. Today's podcast is also brought to you by the projects of The Overhead Wire, sharing information on cities around the world with our readers and subscribers. Join us and try our one-of-a-kind daily newsletter for two weeks free. No credit cards, just an email address by visiting theoverheadwire.com. We've got 71,000 news links in our archive tagged by topic, so sign up and search away. And finally, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention our audiobook version of Raymond Unwin's 1909 classic, Town Planning in Practice. Go to RaymondUnwin.com to find out how you can download the book in your podcatcher and listen to each chapter like an episode of the show. We have a free Word document with timestamps on the site as well. Danielle Aragoni, welcome to the Talking Headways podcast. Thanks so much, Jeff. Glad to be here. Well, glad you're here with us. Before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. In my current role, I am Director of Livable Communities at AARP. I've been here for about three, almost three and a half years. Prior to that, I worked for a good long time in the federal government, both at U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and before that at EPA, always kind of at the intersection of land use and housing and transportation and environment and equity and all those good things. I'm a planner by education, so I went to University of Oregon with a degree in planning there and then later on to Cornell for a degree in planning there too. Cornell is such a popular school for planning. It is. An undergrad program and a grad program, right? Yeah, we've got some great, great folks that have come out of there. Awesome. What got you interested in cities and in housing and transportation and being, you know, part of that conversation? Sure. Yeah, I kind of stumbled upon the topic at undergrad at University of Oregon. I went as a sociology major. I think inherently I was kind of curious about people and how they interact with one another. But the land use part of it, I think, was planted in my brain at an early age. I actually grew up on a ranch at the outskirts of San Jose, back when there was still some agricultural land (laughs) in San Jose, and come from a long line of Californian ranchers and farmers and whatnot. And I distinctly remember around 9, 10, when the suburban kind of sprawl began to encroach upon our ranch and ultimately, frankly, forced us to sell. It was slated for a research and development park and ultimately ended up being more subdivisions But I think that intersection between how these two land uses are in conflict, frankly, when they're poorly designed, really made a lasting impression on me. And then when I grew to understand more how land use has such an incredible effect and impact on people's daily lives and how we interact with one another, I think that's where it all just kind of came together. Yeah, the story of San Jose and the valley down there is just kind of a bummer when you think about it. You know, there's been so many books written about it, but you know, all of the orchards that are gone, all the ranches that are gone. It's, it's just, it annoys me to this day. <laughs> it breaks my heart. It, you know, famously is called the Valley of Heart's Delight. And now it's, you know, this valley of, of heartbreak. And I, I grew up literally between a cactus field, which sounds weird, but is harvested for prickly pears. And then on the other side of me was an apricot orchard, which is quintessential, you know, California, Silicon Valley agriculture. And that's all gone now. So yeah, it, it really is a tale of what went wrong, I think, particularly given you know, the single use zoning that was in place for much of San Jose's history, the auto dependent way in which it grew. You know, there's some bright spots on the horizon now in terms of downtown San Jose, but still it's, it's a tough road to look back on. Yeah, for sure. So I've done work with AARP livable communities before. We had Rodney Harrell on, on episode 71 of the show to talk about the livability index, but perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about the program and the Public Policy Institute as a whole. Sure. So I don't sit in the Public Policy Institute. I sit in the Community, State, and National Division. And what that means is that we support our 53 state offices to do their work. So that's, I think, an unexpected and undervalued and underappreciated element of what ARP does is we actually have a state office in every single state, plus D.C., Puerto Rico, and Virgin Islands. And the way that the livable communities work has really unfolded, I think, over the last several years is 
due in no small part to the leader of, of our group, actually, who is a former planner herself, who really sees the value in supporting communities where they're at and making these decisions and recognizing that there's a lot that needs to be done in order to help people live their best lives at every age. So what we've been doing over the last 10, 12 years is really learning from what our state offices have been able to pilot at the local level. And we saw things like early interventions in placemaking and pop-up bike lanes really grow and blossom. And that has now risen to the point where for the last three years, it's been a strategic priority for our organization and where we are increasingly able to reach local leaders through our weekly newsletter, through our publications, and most importantly, through our state offices to really help support them where they're at in making better decisions around housing, better decisions around transportation and public space and more. So if we go up to the even higher level, what is AARP? Because there's commercials about AARP, you get mailers at certain times in your life, people get frustrated that they get mailers at certain times of their life when they don't think they should be getting a mailer from AARP. What exactly is AARP and what is it for? What does it do? I think uh, there's probably some misconceptions out there about what it is. (laughs) Well, absolutely. There, I'm glad you asked that question. So first of all, we represent 38 million older adults. We are an advocacy organization and we are really poised to support and empower people to live their best lives at every age. So we both advocate on behalf of older adults. And that really runs the gamut from social security to advocating for older adults in the stimulus bills that came out, all the way down to much more sort of organic, locally based issues around pedestrian safety and housing quality and things like that. We are also a membership organization, as you point out. So we do provide information and resources and the famous discounts that come with the <laughs> ARP card. But you know, that's the broad landscape of sort of how can we improve the lives of people individually one by one. I think the local community's work is a recognition that we can't actually do that very well if we aren't creating places that allow people to live well, have options, have choices, and have safe and accessible places in which to live out, we hope, their best lives, really. Yeah, and the placemaking part seems so important because as folks get older, there's changes that happen in their lives. What are some of the changes that people can experience when they are getting older and hopefully you know, aging in place? Yeah, well, you you just hit on, I think, what for me is the crux of this whole issue is we are actually, as a country, aging. And of course, that's no surprise. We're all individually aging. But what's different about what's happening now is that we're actually approaching a demographic tipping point. In 2034, we will be a country comprised more of people over 65 than under 18 for the first time ever. And that really causes us to look at the kind of communities that we're building now and ask, are they being built in ways that help people adjust to those changes as they come? And if we're not doing it now, do we expect that we'll be doing it better in the future? And the answer is, we're not going to get there unless we start making decisions now. So some of the changes that we think about in particular is mobility is a huge one, obviously. I think everyone on this podcast, particularly listening to this podcast, would understand that. We know that older adults outlive their ability to drive from anywhere from seven to 10 years, and that for older adults who are no longer able to drive and who have no other alternatives, that can really mean, in some cases, a death sentence is overstating it, but not too much. We know that that really contributes to increased isolation, which has very real health effects. It's actually the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day, and it contributes to about a 50% increase in dementia. So the effect of being isolated by virtue of not having transportation really does affect physically and mentally the health condition of older adults. There's a whole other sort of body of work around housing and the degree to which our housing market is equipped for the kind of changes that we can expect. And I think everyone expects that, you know, things like vision deteriorate over time or perhaps stamina deteriorates over time. But some of the housing changes that we try to lift up, that we try to encourage don't just respond to people who have mobility issues or who have stamina issues or have balance issues. So we know, for example, that houses that have zero step entries are gonna be better for people who have mobility concerns. But we also know that houses with zero step entries are better if you're pushing a baby stroller or pushing a grocery cart. So you know some of the changes that we look for in communities that respond to the needs of older adults actually really benefit everyone. And that's kind of at the heart of our local community's work is we're trying to create places both inside the home and out in our public space that are more attentive to the needs of all ages and all abilities. 
This might sound like a silly question, but you talked about that tipping point in 2034. I'm wondering if the planet is just going to make us all disappear. <laughs> <laughs> Are you asking, do we have bigger fish to fry? Are there bigger problems that we're, that we're worried about? No, I mean, you know, thinking about demographic changes and the situation in places like maybe Japan or Korea, where the birth rates are lowered and older Americans, are, you know, in the United States at least, are becoming a larger population group. You know, what does that mean? Is it a bell curve? Is 2034 the height of civilization in the United States? <laughs> And then it all goes downhill. I, I know that's a really good question. I guess <laughs> I will tell. I think, you know, we're already seeing communities around the country that are, are seeing what this looks like in which they have more older adults than they have youth and where they see youth fleeing, frankly, because there aren't the kind of economic prospects, which means that you don't have these kind of dynamic intergenerational places. You don't have opportunities for older adults to tutor kids and for kids to teach older adults how to use their smartphones you know, you don't have these opportunities for young adults to provide care for older adults who might need it. So again, there are communities where we're already seeing that dynamic in place. And I think to the credit of people who live in those communities, they recognize that they don't necessarily want to live in a community that is predominantly older adults. They actually really miss and value and treasure communities that are good places for everyone. So a lot of the livable communities work that we see being done in communities is with the idea of creating places that work for young families as much as it does for retirees. You talked about earlier the multiple states, I mean, all the states that you all work in, and you have offices in all those states. I was really impressed by the amount of work that was put into getting these World Health Organization kind of standards implemented in a lot of these cities and have reports. I mean, I didn't even know about San Francisco's document until I was reading the research for this interview, and I noticed most of these plans were connected to the World Health Organization framework. So I'm curious what that framework is and how did it get adopted? And also, how do you get to the point where you can actually advocate in all of these places. It's pretty impressive, I must say. Yeah, so let me let me break that down a little bit because we've made some changes in the last few years to accommodate the growth that we've seen. So the World Health Organization for many years has run something called their Global Network for age friendly Cities and Communities. And in that, they developed what they call their eight domains of livability. And these are really driven by global concerns and feedback about what makes for an age friendly place. So a number of countries around the world are pursuing this. I think there's something like more than 100, perhaps 150 communities that are part of this global network. We at AARP are the U.S. member affiliate for the WHO, which means that we took their eight domains of livability and we implemented them here in the U.S. and adapted them ever so slightly. Fundamentally, nothing has changed. The eight domains are the same across the world. But what we're able to do as the U.S. affiliate is to open up a network of U.S. communities that are committed to that future. So some communities are members of the global network through WHO. Some are members of our network and some are members of both. From our perspective, we don't really care so long as people are thinking about these issues and preparing accordingly. But what that means for our U.S. network, the AARP network of age-friendly states and communities, is that we have a, a very customized set of resources usable by U.S. affiliates, U.S. members who are undergoing this work. And so I'll break down the process a little bit of what that means to be an age-friendly community. An age-friendly community is one that is committing to a better outcome, a better future. There's never going to be a point in time where we check the box, give them a gold star and say, you're done with the work. It just doesn't happen. It's an ongoing kind of commitment to continue to improve and respond to the needs of older adults. It's a five-year process, though, and so it really begins with an age-friendly community. First of all, getting the support of their elected leadership. They have to have a letter for the mayor or a letter from the city council or county council saying, we commit to this work. That's the first step. Then they begin a process, much like most planning efforts, hopefully, if they're well-designed, begins with listening. They do a survey of older adults. They do a survey of the community and find out what are the needs that you have, what's not being met, what's working well, and what can we do more of? In year two, roughly, of that process, they develop an action plan. And that's the plan that you were talking about with San Francisco. So the best plans that we see are ones that are very clear. And they say, here's what we heard from our community members. Here's what we've got right now. And here's what we commit to do differently. The best plans are ones that have very clear objectives and activities and goals and metrics. And there's a lot of them out there that have that. So that then sets the basis for three years of implementation work. At the end of this five-year process, then communities develop what's called a progress report to look back on the progress they've made. So we have probably about 40, 50 communities that have reached that five-year mark. We are actually currently constantly kind of trying to tell the story of what's in those progress reports. What have we seen? 
communities like Des Moines be able to achieve or Philadelphia, who've been at this for a while? Because the results are pretty impressive. There's a few things I think that make it particularly impressive. One is, in many cases, particularly in smaller places, this work is very much volunteer driven. So you don't have to be the city of San Francisco with, you know, millions of people and a huge trillion dollar budget or whatever it is, I exaggerate, but in order to do this, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, you don't need to do that to have this, uh, this work. It's helpful, but we have communities of a couple hundred people that are developing action plans. And even just by aligning resources, by bringing diverse stakeholders to the table, by creating a vision for what they want to achieve, they're able to achieve change. They're able to materially improve the quality of life for older adults. And it's remarkable, I think, the framework that WHO created and that we have seen communities adapt and use. We've been at this since about 2012. We had a couple dozen communities back then join in. We have over 500 now. So the demand for it has been pretty intense over the last few years. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. The eight domains, housing, outdoor spaces, transportation, social participation, health services, social inclusion, civic participation, transportation and information communication. Do you know how these were chosen? So the WHO led that process. They really (laughs) did sort of a global survey. They worked globally to identify what those eight domains are. What I think is interesting about them, I mean, I think I'm a planner, right? So I kind of click into and default to the the built environment ones, the housing, transportation, public spaces. But I'll tell you honestly that I have grown to fully appreciate things like respect and social inclusion as a domain. Because when a community, it almost gives me actually kind of goosebumps to think about, because when a community truly dives into that and figures out what it means to them to be a community that is respectful of and inclusive of older adults, that changes the mindset totally. That's just the beginning of a very different kind of conversation that can be had in communities around the needs of older adults. I think there's, there's kind of a starting proposition that I have seen where older adults are perceived to be frail and needy and burdensome. And frankly, when you start with a frame of respect and social inclusion, that positions you very well as a community to think about older adults in a very different way. One where they are recognized for the contributions that they make to a community, whether that's their purchasing power or their political power or their volunteer power, or just the power of their institutional knowledge and what that means for the community. I mean, it it really is a game changer in how older adults are considered and planned for in the community context. Do you have an example of that? Yeah, I mean, I think what we've seen is examples like a community that in their respect and social inclusion domain will purposely include and develop activities where they're pairing youth with older adults. So I'm going to get the community wrong, but there's a community in Maine, I think, that specifically sought to create those linkages between older adults. So the example that I gave in a kind of a cavalier way before is truthful. Older adults are available and there to help read to younger kids and help them with their very basic elementary school needs. They want to contribute. They want to help. Similarly, older adults really need help with technology sometimes. And, you know, kids know, know their way around a smartphone better than anyone. So just by creating that sort of intentional connection point between those generations, that signals a very different kind of expectation of older adults and of youth that really does lend itself to a more respectful, more inclusive community. My grandmother is always fascinated by my phone, my dad's phone. It's called the magic box and <laughs> it's pretty great. You know, she's like, oh, you can do that? Oh. Yeah. And on that point, Jeff, I mean, I, you know, a lot of people assume that Everyone has a smartphone. Everyone has high-speed internet in the home. And that is just not the case. I mean, we learned in a hard way during COVID that many, many older adults do not have high-speed internet in the home. Even if they did, they don't have a computer in the home and they don't have a smartphone. So the only way they're getting news is through the landline. Yes, I said landline. (laughs) They still exist. Or through personal visits or phone calls or the newspaper or the local news. So You know, we we just can't sort of assume the technological reach is there for all members of society equally. Yeah, my grandmother listens to the radio. That's how she mostly gets her news, um, KCBS in San Francisco. Well, and since you mentioned that, I mean, I'll say that, you know, that one of the domains that you mentioned was communication and information. And that, again, has been a real eye opener for a lot of age friendly communities is an understanding how are older adults getting their news? You know, the mayor's not going to get the news out about where vaccines are taking place by posting it to Facebook. The mayor will need to get on the local radio, on the local cable news program, and get that information out. And it's the age-friendly communities that have taken the time to understand that, that have figured that stuff out before times like this hit. 
Yeah, and that leads to kind of the next question is, how has the pandemic affected the AARP community overall? I mean, I think we all know that older adults have been hugely disproportionately impacted by COVID. Mm -hmm. I I saw a statistic at one point, I'm not sure the current numbers, but something like 90% of deaths occurred among older adults and many of those in nursing homes. So I think this has been a real wake up call for communities about the needs to better monitor, manage, ensure the quality of, of nursing homes. But I think the other real lesson learned here has been in isolation and loneliness and what it really means to be isolated for prolonged periods of time. We've all had a little taste of that now in the course of COVID. And I think that can be instructive of just how much work needs to be done to make sure that we're creating forums and physical places where people can safely gather and connect with one another, because that's the real killer. I mean, frankly, is prolonged isolation when people don't even know what your needs are, that there's no way for those to be addressed. I will say what we've learned about our age-friendly communities in the course of COVID-19 is that many of them have been able to transition very seamlessly to this new world. So I think about communities that used to do, you know, coffee meetings once a month where they'd gather at the senior center, they'd have a speaker come in, you know, it's both a way to engage older adults with one another and it's a way to get information to them. They were able to pivot that over into Zoom meetings or as I mentioned, local cable programs because they learned that that was the way really to get the information out, to get the word out to community members. We also saw that where older adults had turned to their age-friendly community programs or their villages to provide transportation, because once people stop driving, again, how do we fill in the gaps for that? Volunteer driver programs have been a solution. We saw a lot of our age-friendly communities shift from volunteer driver programs to volunteer food delivery programs and prescription delivery programs. So We've seen our age-friendly communities really rise to the challenge and rise to the occasion and step in to address the needs of older adults. Yeah, I noticed, you know, early on during the pandemic, so my grandmother, she lives in Lafayette, which is in the East Bay, and she's 108 now. Wow. And she, yeah, she lives at her house still, but she has people that stay with her, you know, basically 24 hours a day. But at the same time, when the pandemic hit, she wasn't quite sure what the big deal was. And obviously at that age, she actually remembers her dad getting sick in 1918. (laughs) So, (laughs) So I guess she was five years old at the time. But yeah, so it was really hard because, you know, I would go visit each week. My sister would go visit each week. My other sister would come up as frequently as possible from Bakersfield. And, you know, she wasn't sure why we weren't able to come visit. And then my parents, you know, they were trying to stay away because they didn't want to give her the virus. But then eventually they were just like, well, I guess, you know what, we just need to go and visit because the social isolation is going to be even worse than the virus almost to her mental health. And she can't see, she lived by herself until maybe about a couple of years ago. So, you know, it's something that was interesting to me is like, it's almost more important to have that contact and have people visiting, have people see you than it is to worry so much about the virus. I mean, obviously we are worried about transmitting it, but at the same time, like my parents, they needed to go over there else, you know, she was probably going to, you know, not be doing well, I'd imagine. Yeah, I, I will say this has forced some really difficult individual decisions to have to be made on the part of older adults and the families who take care yeah. of love them. I mean, there's no right answer here, right? Like which risk exposure is greater? That's that's something only an individual can make. But what I've seen also on the heels of this is an appreciation and an awareness and an interest in being able to have more alternatives for older adults in terms of where they live. So your grandmother is exceptional and probably the exception um, in terms of (laughs) live, you know, independently. For many other people in her situation, she would probably be in a congregate living facility. And yet what we're seeing is, I see it in my neighborhood here, actually, more interest in building things like ADUs, where you can have an older adult living near you. It's easier to provide care for them. It keeps them out of congregate living facilities. And if people were on the fence before about the value of these ADUs, I think more people are convinced now than ever that there's really a role for them in our communities. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, housing is such a huge part of the discussion, especially here in the Bay Area, but all over the country. And I'm wondering how much that discussion about ADUs is catching on in other places, because I know it dominates here because of the legislation that's been passed. And obviously, you all wrote that guidebook with Karen Chappell, who is a famous planner here. But but I'm wondering how that, how much that impacts the rest of the country and, and how you all see it in your capacity from AARP's perspective. Yeah, we we see a huge promise, a huge amount of promise in ADUs. We did a guide, I'm not sure if this is the one you're referring to or not, Jeff, but called the ABCs of ADUs. And what it does is it it breaks down in in like 20, 25 pages, 
why and how ADUs fit in a community. And I think what we know is that based on a survey we did a few years ago, there is an interest among homeowners in building an ADU. There's an inadequate supply of them. And we know that the, the three top reasons to build an ADU, as was stated then, was an opportunity for additional income. So for older adults for whom property taxes are going up and maybe it's financially difficult to keep stay in their home or their neighborhood. So additional income can be helpful to have someone live nearby to provide care for or to provide care for them. And then frankly, just not to be alone, to have someone close by, whether that's friends or family living nearby. We're going to be doing our survey again this year, and it'll be interesting to see if those numbers have changed based on the experience of COVID. I suspect that they have, because there's a real opportunity, I think, to think differently about housing. We, we know that people want to be able to age in their community. Our surveys say that upwards of 75% of people want to be able to do that, but less than half of the people in our survey say they think they'll be able to. So for those people that can't age in their home and they want to stay in their community, ADUs are a great option to provide an alternative to do just that, particularly in places where there are so few non-large single family homes to choose from. Yeah. And I think most of the listeners of the show will know kind of, you know, what an ADU is generally, but it's always interesting to talk about the different forms they might take. And I think your guide is really good at kind of pointing that out in terms of, you know, it might be a garage, it might be a second floor, it might be a secondary unit, it might be a granny flat, it might be this, that, and the other thing. So they can take so many forms. And I think this discussion about, you know, housing and density and bulk and all that stuff kind of pushes out an actual real discussion about who we're actually trying to house, right? And so I think that's part of the discussion as well, because, you know, we have these these really ridiculous drag out knockdown fights about housing, but we're not talking about who we're trying to connect that housing with. I 100% agree. And I think that's a big part of why we wrote this guide, ABCs of ADUs, to, to kind of put the human face on it and to, to create a little bit more understanding of who it really benefits. And I'll be honest, you know, it, it can be the older residents in the community who are the <laughs> most invested in keeping things exactly as they always have been. I, I don't want to, you know, sort of undersell that point or misrepresent that. I'm not saying that's always the case, but it can be. And so it was doubly important then that we as ARP came out to say, Here's a different way to think about it. You know, let's think about if you want to stay in your community, where would you go? How could you stay in your community? Better yet, if you want to have a caregiver live nearby, what are the options for that person? What can they afford to live in? Let's make it about you as the older and your needs, because when we unpack it in that way, it gets us to the table where we can all see some common solutions. And I think in many ways that is emblematic and a good example of our age family work as a whole. When you think about what are the challenges that you face as an older adult? You know, you walk out the door and cars are driving too fast. So it makes you feel unsafe as a pedestrian. Well, guess what? Lots of people are experiencing that same effect. So how can we as a community help to change the condition so that your life is better? And along the way, we're also making life better for other people too. Along those same lines in terms of the housing discussion, I mean, there's also this whole discussion, and you mentioned it kind of briefly, but the idea that people can either age in place or they can move. But then there's this other discussion about downsizing or moving houses because of that. How much impact does the size of a place have on people's need to move? I mean, sometimes if you have a two-story house and you can only live on the first floor, for example, that upstairs becomes kind of a burden. It does. Yeah. I mean, we, we've we actually done studies that show and it, that evaluate what are the kind of conditions or what are the kind of changes that people need to make to their home in, in order to age in place. And some of those really troubling and problematic conditions are things like master bedroom on the second floor, bathroom on the second floor, hallways and doors that are too narrow. There are some things that just are really hard to fix, to be perfectly honest. I mean, it's difficult to move to have your only bathroom be on the second floor, nothing on the first floor. But through our guide, another resource that we created called the Home Fit Guide, we talk about what are some big changes like that that might be called for, but also maybe are there smaller changes that can be made inside a home to make it a better fit as well. Some of the things that we talk about, again, using kind of an all ages frame, you know, how do you think about lighting? Where are you placing your microwave? <laughs> you know, where are you placing dishes so that you minimize the risk of things falling? How can you better store things inside your front door so that when you walk in and take off your snow boots or your flip-flops, those don't present a, a tripping hazard later on. Like there are basic kind of components and ways to think about your home 
that are pretty low hanging fruit that make them safer and better for all ages. In addition to the really big hard stuff like zero entry doorways and you know getting a bedroom and a full bathroom on the first floor. All of those things are needed. Let's start working on them earlier than we actually need them in our homes. I watch a lot of HDTV and a lot of the home renovation shows. I feel like you need some sort of like a magic elf in the corner talking to some of these people sometimes because of the choices that they make. I know it's mostly the homeowner that makes these choices, but sometimes it can be a little bit frustrating to watch them. And especially, you know, when you have those open plan places where people put their dishes and things like that, and it's like, uh, that might fall on you. It's also going to get dusty. The things where, you know, you want some universal design, but you see a step in some places. I wonder if that's a show that you all would be interested in producing. (laughs) Yes. Maybe, you know, like, you know, VH1 used to have that pop-up video where they had like the little bubbles on top. That. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe something like that. Well, I'll tell you what, we have something kind of like that. We actually <laughs> have an app store called uh, HomeFit AR. It's an augmented reality tool in the app store that lets, it only works on Apple phones right at the moment, but it lets you hover over your room. And what it does is it'll ask you questions about, you know, is that a roll under sink? For your bathroom, for example, you know, it kind of maps you through a few different elements of a home fit home in three rooms in your home. So that that's not quite a pop up video, but we're getting there. Yeah, but that's exactly right. I mean, the whole point is like, I know it's really difficult and people are not prone to think 20 years down the road because that's just not how we're wired, particularly in the United States. But the reality is that if you do think about your needs from a broader set of capabilities, even visitability, who might be visiting you that might require your home to be organized or navigable in a different way that can get you to different outcomes. Area rugs, they're terrible. Like I love them. I still have them in my home, but I do so really, you know, fully aware that this is not an age-friendly feature in a home. Or if I'm going to put one down, let me let me really mount it solidly with double stick tape to make sure that it doesn't present the hazard that it might otherwise. Yeah. Well, you all, you know, in addition to the ADU document, you have lots of other ones, parks, and you also did a zoning one with CNU. Do you have a favorite document that you all have created in the last few years? Oh, that's completely unfair. That's like, I love so many. That's what we do. (laughs) (laughs) We're unfair. I I will be honest. I have a special place in my heart for the parks guide. Um, It's called Creating Parks and Public Spaces for People of All Ages. And we did it with Trust for Public Land and 880 Cities. And I love this guide so much because I love parks, I love being outside. And I was not able to fully put on the right kind of lens to evaluate how parks are or are not working for people of all ages and all abilities. And this guide is designed to do exactly that. So it actually provides six or seven different tools, including the livability index that we talked about at the top, but also does things like uses the park serve tool and uses our walk audit tool that put information and tools in the hands of local leaders who can go out and evaluate parks in their community right now and come up with solutions to make them better for people tomorrow. Like it is very actionable, very usable. So I'm, I'm very proud of that as well as the ABCs of ADU's guide. That's another favorite too. Yeah. I, I like the zoning guide. I mean, I know it's pretty recent and it just came out, you know, maybe a month ago or so, but yeah, yeah I mean, I like that type of stuff where you can talk about changing the community from that higher level not that I don't like parks and not that I don't like ADUs. Obviously, I do. I love all this stuff because it's city-related, urban-related. But that's really cool that you all were able to put that together as well. Yeah, I'm really proud of the zoning guide. I can tell you this was a two-year labor of love. And both Lynn Richards and I will say that and mean it from the bottom of our hearts. We, we worked really <laughs> hard at this because it went through a lot of permutations. It's no surprise to you. It's pretty hard to put technical speak into very accessible layperson speak. So we spent a lot of time trying to get that right. But the other part of it was that we were able to capitalize on what CNU knows works in commercial corridors and adjacent neighborhoods. We know that things like parking requirements matter a lot. You know, adjacency requirements, sidewalk provisions, all of these little kind of interstitial decisions that get made about the public sphere or about the intersection between public sphere and private buildings. All of those really make the difference in terms of creating communities that feel inclusive, that feel dynamic, that feel vibrant, and that are the kind of places that we all want to be. And again, when I say we all want to be, we all want to be there, all ages, people of all abilities from all backgrounds. So how could we make communities that serve all of us better? That's what that guide's all about. You also support communities through challenge grants. How does that work and what kind of projects do you all support? So I'm really excited and proud of our Community Challenge Grant Program. Many people might not be aware that we actually invest in communities in every single state in the country. 
And we've been doing that for five years now. We're in our fifth year. And what we do with our grant program is to support and invest quick action grants that can really be used to demonstrate change. So we go out to communities once a year. We're in the middle of that application window now. It closes April 14th. And what we do is we ask them, what is it that you need or what is it that you're trying to sort of demonstrate in your communities that, that is part of a larger plan? So if you're seeking to make your community more pedestrian safe, if you're seeking to diversify your housing options, if you're seeking to improve your public spaces or your downtown, what is one small piece or what is one catalytic demonstration of that that we can help invest in and that we can help fund that will help you build that broader set of support for that work? What we have seen across the board is that our grants largely go to public space enhancements, which makes perfect sense. So we funded things like accessible bench programs, signage, trails, bike racks, murals, lighting, planter boxes, community gardens, stages. I mean, all these kind of features that, that create that public space um, energy and that contribute to the energy of public spaces and draw people in. I would say public spaces certainly has been our biggest category. Second category has been transportation. So we see a lot of innovation there around certainly pedestrian safety, bikeability, improving people's ability to use transit. So how can you, for example, one of the really creative projects that we saw last year was, I think it was called the, the door program where they used recycled doors to say this, you know, transit is your doorway to destinations. And so they use recycled doors at transit stops with information mounted on them on where those transit lights are going to to demystify how to use the bus. You know, if you've never used the bus ever or haven't used it in many years, it's a pretty daunting prospect. How do you get on? How do you pay? How do you know when to get off? Where's it going? When does it come? So we've seen a lot of really creative grants around that as well. So yeah, there've been some great projects that we've funded over the years. We have seen across the board that they've been very effective, both in attracting additional funding, which is part of the thing that we hope for. We know that we can't build mega parks, we can't do giant projects, but our contributions can help to attract further funding or public funds if that was on the bubble, if that was in question. We've seen that our grants are able to get over policy roadblocks and get get policy change to be adopted because you've now made the case. For example, you know, with traffic calming techniques, we've we've funded temporary traffic circles, we've funded bulb outs, temporary bike lanes. You know, once you have the data that shows that those things really work, It's much easier to get the policy change adapted and put in place. And then finally, we've seen 100% of our grantees say that this has really gone a long way to helping us build awareness about these issues and attracting new engagement, whether it's from communities or whether it's from elected leaders or whether it's from other organizational partners. So I'm super proud of our, our challenge grant program. This year, we're funding it again. We have a couple areas that we're leaning into a little bit more, one of which is COVID-19 recovery. So we want to see how our grant program can help communities to recover from the economic devastation of COVID-19. We know that our downtowns are suffering. We know that our main streets are you know, on the ropes right now. What are those investments that could help those communities come back and come back stronger and better? And also we're really interested in diversity and inclusion. We know that across the board, I can think of a dozen grants just off the top of my head that have really lifted up and celebrated diverse populations within our communities. Everything from a park of East African refugees in San Diego that really was built and designed with them in mind, with them at the table. Everything from that to transit programs that translated language into the Iraqi language so that new Iraqi refugees could better use public transit. But this year we were really leaning in more and we really wanna see how grants that we make can be even more inclusive of diverse populations and make the difference in how all of us fit together and work in our communities. That's awesome. Where can folks find that? Where can they apply if they want to kind of take a look and see if their project might fit your criteria? So there's a couple links. One is aarp.org slash community challenge. That's where you can find out more information about who's eligible, what are the deadlines, and how to apply. And if you're curious to learn if your community has had a grant in the past or if there have been grants of a particular type in the past, we have an interactive map called livablemap.aarp.org that lets you go in and search by topic, by keyword, by jurisdiction, even by population size to see a little bit more about what we funded in the last five years, four years rather. What's the best place to get all these resources that you all have? 
So our front door is aarp.org slash livable. That is the place where you can go to learn more about our age-friendly network program. That's where you can download or request print versions of our publications. That's where you can sign up for our weekly newsletter, which I'd highly encourage all your listeners to sign up for. It is a practitioner-focused newsletter. So at the top of the hour, we talked about some of the things that ARP as a, <laughs> a monolithic organization does. We put out a lot of publications. Our little newsletter on livable communities is very much practitioner focused. So it, it's targeted at local leaders. It's targeted at folks on the ground who are working in communities. And we try to make information very relevant to them, new resources, new publications, new announcements, and the like. And that's also where you can find through ARP.org Livable. That's also where you can find our interactive map, links to the livability index, and much more. Awesome. Well, Danielle, there's so much here to learn and, and understand, and I appreciate you coming on the show. We really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks for joining us. The Talking Headways podcast is a project of The Overhead Wire on the web at theoverheadwire.com. Sign up for a free trial of The Overhead Wire Daily, our 14-year-old Daily Cities news list, by clicking the link at the top right of theoverheadwire.com. And please, please, please support the pod at patreon.com slash theoverheadwire. Many thanks to our current patrons for their ongoing support. And as always, you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Overclass, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. And you can always find a digital home at usa.streetsblog.com. Dot .org. See you next time at Talking Headways.